go ahead and get started tonight. I do uh, I want to start and do a little something different. I would like for us to uh, gather in the altar tonight and uh, pray over our Bible school, which begins on Monday. Pray for all the students that will be involved and, and uh, that will be coming and just ask God to move in a mighty way. we got a uh, special guest going to come this week, uh, this coming week, and he'll be sharing the gospel and, and, uh, and looking forward to having him come and be with us. Uh, and then the rest of the week is going to be good as well with different things. But uh, I'd like to start tonight and us uh, begin in the altar and uh, begin to pray and just lift up our, our vacation Bible school. Um, does anybody else have a prayer request? Miss Lula, how is Joe doing? Good, good. Anybody else have a, a Definitely. Definitely. We should. Definitely. Anybody else? If not, then let's gather around the altar tonight and uh, let's. Uh, Begin to pray. Lord Jesus, we just come tonight, and I just want to praise you and thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for grace that is ever abounding, Lord, around us. Lord, the, the strength to be able to be here tonight, the, the health to be able to come to worship, uh, the freedom to be able to worship. We just praise you for that. And, Lord, tonight I ask that you would touch us, Lord, as we look into your word and help us, Lord, to glean from it, to be able to uh, walk closer with you uh, Lord, as we heard on Sunday, uh, Lord, that that close that close walk, that uh, continuous uh, connection with you is what we are in need of. Uh, Lord, and your word says that without you we can do nothing. And Lord, I confess that to you tonight. Uh, Lord, Lord, that I can't do anything, but Lord, that there's nothing impossible with you. <clears throat> your word teaches us, Lord, that in it that uh, without a shadow of a doubt that your strength is made perfect in weakness. And, Lord, I confess tonight that there is a great opportunity to show just how strong you are because, Lord, I realize how weak I am in doing, Lord, what is needing to be done tonight. We ask that you would be with all these prayer requests. We pray, Lord, for um, Lord Miss Sharon Blevins' granddaughter and Tyler and Alex Green. We pray, Lord, for Miss Shirley's Sister Evelyn, we ask, Lord, that you'd be with, continue to be with Joe. We ask, Lord, that you'd continue to heal Brother Gene as he's been sick and under the weather. We ask, God, that you'd be with others, Lord, that are in our congregation that just need your touch. Brother Pee Wee, uh, Shirley and Bruce, we ask that you'd be with them. Uh, Lord, we know that you can do, and that's why we ask you to. Lord, we believe in you put all of our trust and our hope in you. We ask, God, that you would be with uh, Brother Clay and Meg as they are, uh, Lord, going through some training, and we ask that you'd be with them. Uh, Lord, I ask, and Lord, I don't do this often, but I ask, God, that you would be uh, with our church and in and, and ways, Lord, that uh, with some things on the horizon, I pray, God, that you would just touch. Lord, I pray uh, for the Southern Baptist denomination as a whole, Lord, that we would um, wake up and, Lord, that we would see what is, uh, Lord, the greatest need of the hour. And we pray that you'd be with us, Lord, uh, and that you would strengthen, uh, Lord, the things that need to be uh, held fast to. And, Lord, we ask that you would just be with us as we 
uh, look forward to worship on Sunday. We pray that you'd be with the, the worship services that are coming up. And Lord, we, we ask that you'd be with our Vacation Bible School and every student, uh, every teacher. We pray, God, for every lesson. Brother Lewis, as he travels, Lord, to share the gospel, we ask, Lord, that you'd just be and, Lord, that you'd work in a mighty way. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Be with us tonight, Lord, as we look into your word. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. If you've got a Bible, turn with us tonight to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I don't know if you noticed or not, but I got a Bible laying on the pulpit and I got a Bible in my hand. Uh, last night of the revival over at Yellow Mountain, I carried both Bibles in and carried both Bibles to the pulpit. And there was a man asked me, he said, have you loaded both barrels tonight? Um, to be honest, uh, the my Bible that I've been preaching out of for years, uh, I've about wore it out, and uh, I had to uh, glue it while I was uh, going back and forth to uh, Yalla Mountain. And uh, there's a place I can send it, and I can get it rebound and fixed, but I'll have to do without it for about six weeks to six months, depending on where they are, uh, and being backed up, and... Uh, they can't guarantee me that all the pages that I need to stay in it can stay in it, and so I'll just keep Gorilla gluing it. And uh, so I bought one, but it's like toting around a locust log when I try to preach. And uh, so this is, I bought this one <laughs> to carry while I'm preaching and uh, paid $10 for it. And I got to thinking after I'd done it, I've probably in my ministry bought probably 10 or 15 of these and God's always asked me to give them away. Uh, and so I'll get to preach out of them for a little bit, and then I'll end up giving somebody a ride in a truck or something like that, and meet somebody, and he'll say, I need you to give them that Bible. So as long as I can go to Dellinger's and buy one of these, we'll just keep doing it. But, uh, um, but anyway, so I'll, I'll be toting this one, but that, don't worry. It's kind of like a, it's a, a fellow went one time, a young couple of young boys, they decided to go to each other's church, and one guy went to the Catholic Church with his buddy, and they were asking, you know, what does this mean, what does that mean? He was like, oh, it don't mean anything. And uh, he said, uh, so he went with the Baptist young man, his Baptist friend, and they went, Baptist preacher got in a pulpit, and he said, what does this mean, what does that mean? When that preacher took off his watch and turned it upside down, laid it beside the pulpit, that Catholic young man said, what does that mean? He said, it means take your shoes off, we're going to be here a while. <laughs> Don't mean anything necessarily for me to carry both Bibles with me in the pulpit. It's just so I don't tear one up. But First Thessalonians chapter 5, if you'll remember, uh, back on around Mother's Day, uh, when I preached to you on the woman with the issue of blood and the title of the message is I'm holding on, uh, I, I talked about that the Scripture deals with uh, some instances where it says to hold fast. And I said that I would probably uh, begin a short series of sermons on Wednesday nights uh, about holding fast. And uh, uh, if you read the scripture, there's several different portions where it talks about to hold fast, uh, but some of them are meaning the same thing. If you look in the book of Revelation, it means to hold fast uh, those that you have to what you have. That's actually used a couple of times. Uh, but I'm going to start in 1 Thessalonians 5, and, and I may, uh, what I'm going to try to do is look at the, the context uh, around why uh, it is saying to hold fast, and then we'll apply that uh, for us. And, and we may look at it, uh, you've probably heard me say this, but it bears repeating, and it's, it's something worth listening to again, uh, that when it comes to Scripture, 
you need to look at it through three lenses. Number one, what's it saying primarily? Who is Paul writing to here when he writes uh, the letter to the Thessalonians? So the primary meaning, the primary context, what's it saying uh, in the very uh, essence of what, who was he writing it to, what was, what was the purpose in the writing, and so the primary meaning. Uh, and then you have what uh, you could call the prophetic meaning. Where do I see Jesus in this? How is it pointing me to Christ? Because if you read something in the Scripture, it should always, uh, Christ is the center of it all. The whole entire uh, Bible, all 66 uh, books that have made it into our canon, they all are part of uh, are centered around Jesus Christ. And then the practical meaning. How do I take what I have written or read and what has been written and how do I apply it practically? And so uh, we will look at those things uh, through the Scripture and I'll, I'll, I will point just briefly uh, because even in First Thessalonians there was uh, in, in some of the things that I have read and, and to some of whom I have read uh, there is a difference in how it is applied, and what is the primary meaning. So, uh, But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, now I'm going to actually back up to verse 12, and I'm going to read through verse number 24. But fret not thyself, I'm not going to preach all 12 verses. I'm interested in verse 21, okay? Uh, and so the Bible says in verse 12, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you, and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you. And to esteem them very highly in their in love uh, for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Abstain from the all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless uh, unto the following, unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Paul, if you read the, the, the letter to the Thessalonian church, uh, spends a great deal of time uh, talking about how uh, much, if you will, a model church that they really are. As a matter of fact, some years ago, I preached through uh, the book of 1 Thessalonians and uh, actually entitled that message, A Model Church in Modern Times, because uh, Paul actually uh, talks about in the first uh, chapter... He discusses their labor of love, their work of faith, and their waiting in hope in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 1. And so, uh, and if you, if I, the way that I broke it down in those five uh, chapters was, uh, in chapter 5, was a model sobriety, how they walked in the Lord. Uh, they were model servants, they were model saints, and, and uh, so the different things as you go down through there uh, looking at that. And uh, so, but Paul was dealing with them because they really were a church that uh, you could really model yourself after. There was a lot of things that were going on around them. There was a lot, uh, as a matter of fact, when you read uh, chapter 4, uh, there was a lot of sexual perversion that was going on uh, in the town. And so it was having its influence and, and on the people. And Paul was exhorting them uh, to keep themselves pure and holy and abstain from the immorality that was basically allowed to, to carry on. And, and so Paul, is, as he's writing this letter, uh, he's telling them and giving them doctrinal issues, but then also how to live out what the Bible teaches, or what to live out what Christ has given us and how to follow his example. And in chapter 5, beginning there in verse 12 where I got to you, I began reading. Uh, Paul's actually coming to the end. Now, uh, you know, a lot of times we forget that Paul didn't write chapter and verse. He wrote in paragraphs, right? I mean, he wrote letters. He didn't write like what we see. 
And so uh, I, I foresee that this is the paragraph before the end because uh, in verse 25, brethren, pray for us. He's coming to the close and he's fixing to say, uh, greet all brethren with a holy kiss and, and uh, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the, unto all the holy brethren. Uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. That's his conclusion. And I, uh, you know, everybody wants to talk about getting back to the old times. And uh, getting back to some old paths. Now, I'm not, I'm not knocking this, but I, I want to give you something to laugh about just a little bit. And I, I, there was a man who said, we need to get back to the old paths. We need to get back to the old And I agree. There are some things that we ought not to stray from. Uh, but I asked him one time, I said, how far back you want to go? Paul said to greet one another with a holy kiss. He didn't want to go back that far. You know, I, I, I mean, you, you know, uh, there, there's some ignorance that goes along with that statement, Okay. Uh, but what Paul is exhorting these people to do is he's getting to the end. He is actually given some practical steps of how to walk with the Lord. Uh, and when you begin in chapter, or chapter uh, 5 verse 12 and you begin to come down through that list, especially uh, when you get into the, the shorter verses in verse 16, rejoice evermore. Uh, of course, we know that Philippians 4.4 4 says rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And so he was talking about having that spirit of joy and rejoicing. Quench not the spirit. Verse 19, pray without ceasing and everything give thanks. All of those are very good practical things to live out, uh, if you will, that we ought to always be praying. We ought to always be thankful. We ought not to quench the spirit of the Lord. Amen. Uh, you know, it's amazing to me how powerful that the Spirit of God is, but how sensitive He is, and if He is quenched, He will not have anything to do with what's happening. Um, you know, spent those days at Yellow Mountain with Brother Carl, every single night he would say before we'd pray in the altar, be sure to invite the Lord in. He's a gentleman. He's not going to come busting in. He's going to come in invited. And, and you and I need to understand we can still have a church meeting without having a meeting with Jesus. And we can still come together and have singing and preaching and go through the rituals without necessarily having what is uh, really a, a, a spiritual time with the Lord. And we have to make sure we don't quench the Spirit. The Bible teaches us that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And so we have to make sure that the Spirit of God has the ability and the opportunity to flow f freely around us. So quench not the Spirit. Despise not prophesying. Now what he's saying there is as men are forth-telling and truth-telling, don't despise it. Accept it. Now some primarily are saying that verse 21 goes back to verse number 20 when he says, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. That what he's saying there specifically is to listen to what's being said and prophesied and listen to it and make sure uh, that it's worthy and it's valuable and it's virtuous, okay? I believe, I believe, as I have studied it and read it out, that Paul is saying, despise not prophesying, and then the next thing to walk in a, the life that Christ would have you to walk in is to be sure that everything is put to the test, including the preaching and the teaching, including what's being said, but in everything. I, I believe songs ought to be proven. I believe sermons ought to be proven. Speakers ought to be proven. Amen? All of it. And so uh, what, when he comes to verse 21, prove all things, semicolon, hold fast that which is good. And so the thought here is to prove everything and hold fast that which is good. Here, here's how I'm going to break it down. Two points. How about you on a Wednesday night? Only got two points for a Wednesday night message. The first one, scrutinize everything. Secondly, secure what's good. Make sure you put everything to the test. Now the word prove means to examine. It gives the, the idea of examine it, testing it, uh, and it's actually was used, that word was used 
in trying and testing out metals to make sure they were genuine and real. Gold and silver. Put it to the test to see if it'll work. I, I mean, just this past week, we were working at, at my house, me and Matt Stafford. And this is just a good example. I need to change the light bulb. Now, I've got a light bulb. I've got a ladder out there at the barn that'll reach the top of the barn, but it's absolute bare to waller it up there. And I knew I was only about that much too short of reaching it on what I had in there, and I knew that Matt was about that much taller than me and could reach it. And so I put an old set of sawhorses underneath the, the, the light bulb. And now, he's not that big of a chicken but that one sawhorse was wobbly bad you could shake it and he just looked at me and I said oh pal I've been up it without anybody standing around I weigh a lot more than you hop up there and let's change that light bulb and I'll hold it and it's what he said if it'll hold you preacher it'll hold me I'm not sure if that was a, a cut or not uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just letting it go I'm just kind of letting that one slide if you will but here's what he was saying you've proven it you've examined it you've tested it I know I can trust it and so what Paul is saying here to this Thessalonican church you need to test, prove and examine and scrutinize everything to make sure that it's the real deal that it's genuine that it's not something that is fake that it's the real McCoy. And if it's real, hold on to what's good. Test it. Now, uh, I, I, I want to uh, uh, kind of expound on the word scrutinize. I, I, I love looking up words that you use, but you don't always define. You know, I believe sometimes it's like we, we are in the... Do you remember uh, The Princess Bride? Any of you ever remember that movie? You keep using that word, but I don't know if you, I don't think you know what it means. Uh, I think a lot of times we use words, but we don't know exactly what they mean. And so uh, the, the Strong's Concordance and Dictionary says the word prove means to test, examine, to prove, to scrutinize, to see whether a thing be genuine or not. The second definition is to recognize as genuine after examination and to approve and to deem worthy. And so what Paul is saying is you make sure you put it to the test. Now the word scrutinize means to search closely, to examine or inquire into critically as to scrutinize the measures of administration or to scrutinize the private conduct or motives of individuals. That's the 1828 Noah Webster Dictionary. To search closely, to examine, or to inquire into critically. I remember when I was a boy that I used to buy CDs at Radio Shack and tapes. Now, some of y'all don't even know what I'm talking about. All right, but some of y'all do. As a matter of fact, I finally threw away some of them old singles. You remember the singles cassettes that you could get, and they'd, you could get them for three or four bucks there at Radio Shack, and they'd come in the, the, the card back or card, cardboard covers and all that. I still had some of those. I don't know why. Still got some single CDs. But anyway, I remember I would go and I would look, and I'd buy these CDs, and the first thing I'd do is go to the back to the thank yous, and I'd want to know if they thank God. And I would think if they thank God, they're worth listening to. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Jay-Z, he might have thanked God, but it wasn't the same one I'm thinking. All right? Ja Rule might have thought God. Now, I'm kind of sharing some of my carnality to some of y'all. Some of y'all are, I don't know what you're talking about, and you're lucky. But, I mean, some, their lyrics didn't prove what they said in the thank yous. That's not scrutiny. That's not proving. That's not testing. You have to put things to the test. I want you to go with me. Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse number 27. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse number 27. What, how, what are we supposed to do in the purpose of testing and trying some of these things? Jeremiah 6, 27. If you just want to write that down, you can. I, I, I cheated when I was putting out my outline, I actually, so I don't have to turn and find it, 
I've got it right here. But Jeremiah 6, 27 says, I have set thee for a tower and a fortress among my people that thou mayest know and try their way. Now, of course, he's talking about, I believe there prophetically, the Scripture, because the Scripture, if our life ought to line up with anything, it's the plumb line of God's Word. It's the plumb line of the Scripture. Uh, and then, not only that, but He has set Him to be a tower. Christ ought to be our standard, don't you believe? Now, I understand I'll never walk in the perfect Holiness that he has walked in, but it sure doesn't give me a pass to sin. I still need to walk as closely to him as I can. Uh, I, I remember one time walking in the woods with Dad, and Dad said, you walk with me. And I walked on one side of the trail, and he walked on the other, and I made so much noise it wasn't even funny. And he finally turned around, and he said, I told you to walk with me. And I said, well, I am walking with you. He said, you're not walking with me. You're walking over there. When I say walk with me, you put your steps where I put my steps. When my foot comes up, your foot goes down. And I learned that day in the woods to walk how my father would walk through the woods and if you will, get me to the place where it says to walk circumspectly, making every step count, making sure I'm walking in the direction I'm supposed to. Christ ought to be our example and he ought to be our standard. We ought to walk where he walks. We ought to step how he steps. We ought to love how he loves. We ought to see people like he sees people. We ought to react as he would react. We ought to be like Jesus in this world because that's what he saved us, called us and bought for us to be like, not how we want. We're not supposed to look at the Christian across the, the pew from us or across the sanctuary and say, well, I don't do that. We're supposed to look toward Jesus and we're supposed to say, this is how I'm supposed to live. And Jeremiah said, he's saying, I have told you and set you as a tower and so that you are able to try and to know their way so that you give that standard. Not only Jeremiah 6.27, but if you'll turn with me, or you can just listen to me, Ephesians 5.10, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Ephesians 5.10, proving, examining what is acceptable in the eyes of the Lord. <laughs> some, some of you younger ones in here going... My daddy used to say, my mama, you, would you want to be doing that when Jesus comes back? How many of you ever heard that? Would you want to be doing that when the Lord comes back? What would you be doing? Hey, Paul told the Ephesians, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. You need to test, and if what you're doing would meet his approval, or if you'd have to be shirking back and jerking back when, when the Lord shows up that you're not going to want to be involved in that, then chances are you ought not to be involved in it. Because if you're saved by his grace, his spirit's in you, which means his spirit's with you, and you're carrying his name into whatever action you are doing. And so you need to prove. You need to, church, we ought to be asking, is this acceptable unto God from everything? From everything that's done from the pulpit, everything that's done into the, the, the Sunday school classrooms, the youth department, every ministry that we have and that we're involved in, everything that we support financially, or was this acceptable unto the Lord? And the problem is we live in such a day that we have grown accustomed to evil that we have gotten to the place where we just say, well, it ain't that bad. It's not that bad. I've had men talk to me before and tell me stories and they'll say, now this has got a bad word in it, but not that bad of a bad word. You can handle it, can't you, preacher? But that's where we are in society today, isn't it? Is that we are, well, God, I know that's not necessarily the way you would want it, but maybe we can just let it slide. But the way you've seen is death. That's what the Bible teaches us. And not necessarily physical death, not necessarily, if you will, a, a long-lasting death, but there are some things that can die because of sin. And yet we, we seemingly are more accepting of what's happening around us. When is enough going to be enough? Now, now, can I say something to you? And you're going to hear my heart in this statement. So please, if you tune me out after this, you can tune me out. There is a church crowd that tries to be so holy that nobody except Jesus could be acceptable in their presence. 
There is a crowd that sets the standard so high with their religious beliefs and traditions and their own ideas that nobody can make it in that group. And then there are those that are over here that say, well, he loves you, it's going to be okay. There are two extremes, and I believe Jesus Christ wants us to walk in a fine balance in between. Now, why do, I see that? why do I say that? Because when you find Jesus, he was hard on the religious crowd, but he was gracious and compassionate to the sick and the sinful. Now, he, doesn't, he did never once condone sin. He would say, go and sin no more. He would pull them out of that. He would show them a better way. But not a single time did he say, well, we'll let this one slide. And so you and I, as a church, what is acceptable? Proof what is acceptable under the Lord. We have to make sure that we walk in that closeness to where there is the the crowd over here that thinks that whatever should go should go. They think we're too strict. And the crowd over here that's so strict, they think that we're too liberal and too loose. And if you walk that line, you'll walk right where God can use you. Amen? Amen? Do I have some agreement on that? Because the problem is, the problem is, you've got that crowd over here that are ridiculous in their standards. And then you've got this crowd over here that's ridiculous in their lack of standards. Jesus is my standard. The Scripture is my God. And so if I follow his footsteps and believe his word and walk as he would walk, I believe I should be okay. And then there I will be able to prove what is acceptable unto the Lord. Do you know why? Because his character and his word will never contradict. His character and his word will never cause confusion. His character and His Word will be two parallel lines. And if you know anything about parallel lines in, in, in math, and in, that they have no, they have, that, that as long as infinity can go, they never cross. They never mess up. And that is exactly the character and the Word of God are like two parallel lines and they never contradict And they never cross each other. And if you will walk between those two parallel lines, what some wonderful boundaries there is to it. And then there's that crowd. I'm going to run this rabbit for just a little bit because I feel I told you it was only two points, so I got a little leeway, right? There's that crowd that says, I don't want any rules. I don't want any regulations. Thank God we have got two white lines that are painted on the road and then a yellow line in between. Amen? Because those two white lines let me know if I go to the opposite side of either one of them. If I go too far left, I'm in the ditch. If I go too far right, I'm in the ditch. And it, but if it also lets me know if I'll go between the yellow line and the white line, there's safety right there. But if I cross that yellow line, then there's going to be a wreck and probably death. Amen? Or great injury. Apply the same thing to the Christian life. And if you and I will walk between the two parallel lines of the Word of God and the character of Christ, then there is a lot of freedom and a lot of life to be lived in between those. But if I go too far left, I'm hurt. If I go too far right, I'm hurt. The problem is walking in that middle because you've got the, the, the ones that are on the left that say that you're ridiculous and then you've got the ones that say on the right that tell you you're going to hell because you don't have the same standards that they have. I just give them guys a thumbs up. God bless you and go on. I ain't going to argue with them. And I'll be honest with you, I used to did. You can ask my wife. I'd get fiery mad, argue, and I'd think, I'm going to straighten them boys out. And if I can't do it with love, I'll do it with a hammer. And now I've kind of got to the point and the place in my life to where, listen, there's too many people that are literally dying and going to hell to argue with you over pants or dresses to argue with you over facial hair or not. I, I mean, I was in a meeting and I had a man that stood behind the pulpit and preached and he said that a man of God shouldn't have any facial hair. And, he, and this is what he said. He said, I don't have scripture to back that up, but that's what I believe. And then he was introduced to me at a distance and he said, that boy ought to shave his beard because until he does, I'll never ask him to preach. Well, I want to I wanna just say publicly right here, I don't want to preach in that kind of pulpit. Because that's ridiculous. I'm not going to argue with you over whether or not you got facial hair or not. Amen? 
But I, I, I mean, I, I don't really, I mean, what are you going to do about John the Baptist? I mean, we lived in a day where Charles Spurgeon and those men, they believed if you didn't have a beard down just about your belly button, you wasn't a man of God. And then all of a sudden, somewhere along the line, somebody decided to shave theirs and they realized, I can preach and I can study the Word of God and feel the anointing of heaven even when I've got a shaved beard. What? It's foolish. And so why not we get to the place where we try to scrutinize and prove what is acceptable in the eyes of the Lord. So you have, you have Jeremiah 6 uh, when I read to you that he, you, he has set as a tower to try and to know the ways, then we have Ephesians 5.10 prove that which is uh, acceptable uh, to the Lord. And then 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, paraphrasing that verse for you, try the spirits. Try the spirits. There can be some things that can lead you wrong. So you got to test it. you got to try it. You got to prove it. <laughs> How many of you legit? How many of you seriously can tell the difference between regular Dr. Pepper and Diet Dr. Pepper? Or how many times when they get it mixed up do you have to take two or three sups? And try to convince yourself it's one or the other. What are you doing? You're testing it. You're trying. Because they're so close. They're so close. We are living in a day where things are so close. We are living in a day where there's just enough truth that it's easily to deceive. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that during... The latter days, that if it wasn't for the Spirit of God, that even the very elect could be deceived. And so you and I have to have enough of the right stuff to know when it's the wrong stuff. You know how, they, how they're able to pick counterfeits, right? They don't study all the different kinds of counterfeits. They study the original and the real deal. And so when they see a counterfeit... They know the original and try the spirits. First John chapter four verse one. That is what first. That's what John is telling when he says, uh, "Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world." You've got to be willing to put it to the test. We live in this day and time where there's so much that has the appearance, as the, 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 the New Testament teaches us, has the appearance of godliness, but it's denying the power thereof, that churches may be big, churches may be strong, churches may be this, that, or the other, but in reality, there is no Spirit of God. There's no anointing. There's no unction. It's missing. Do you know that John also tells us in the first epistle, uh, and, and, and I preached this message uh, while I was in Yellow Mountain, how do I know that I'm saved? But he talks about that I know that I'm saved because I have the unction from heaven. I, I've got something that's hooked me up to a different world. The Holy Ghost. And so... John is saying, try it because there's so much that can deceive. We are living in that day. So we have to put things through the scrutiny of being tested and examined to make sure it's real, to make sure it's the right stuff. <laughs> I remember being in school. We were doing something about gem mining and all of that. And there was an old boy come, and he had, I mean, it wasn't that big, but he had a, what he said was a gold nugget. He said, I'm going to tell my daddy he don't have to work no more. Look what I've got. And what he had was a big chunk of fool's gold. He was convinced. I got the mother load right here. It's over. I mean, he even told me. He said, I don't have to go to school no more. I got all the money I'm ever going to need. Son. That's fool's gold. What? Yeah, it's fool's gold. Looks like gold, 
till you start testing it. And then you realize it's fool's go. Oh, he was down the mouth, heart broke, mad, and ended up giving it away to some girl on the bus. Because he said, ain't no need me having it if it ain't the real deal. Hey, can we take that, that little example, and say there ain't no need in having it if it ain't the real deal? But you and I need to test it. We need to put it through the test. Let, let it be filtered through the character of Christ and the, and the Word of God and make sure that it lines up with both of those. And if it does, it's got to be acceptable unto the Lord. It's got to be the real deal. If it's not going to veer off any of those paths, it's got to be the real deal. If it lines up with the standard of Jesus Christ, it's got to be the real deal. Test the spirits. Listen to this. This is a quote that I read today. Testing demanded is not an isolated action but it's rather to be settled, to be the settled rule and continuing practice. The word here that he uses and prove is an ongoing thing. Keep testing it. Do you know, I, I, can we call it accountability in the church life? Now, there's a lot of things that we... Nobody ever wants to talk about accountability anymore, do they? Uh, you know how you make a disciple... You hold him accountable so that he learns to walk. But nobody ever wants to be held accountable anymore, do they? I I, I mean, can we say, can I, can I, and I'm, I'm, I mean, yeah, I'm going to say it. That's why we're in the state we're in in this country. It's because there's been a whole lot of politicians with no accountability. They've been able to do whatever they wanted, however they wanted, whenever they wanted, and, and we've not held them accountable. And because we have not held them accountable, then we have ended up in the mess that we're in. And I'm talking about both sides of the aisle. I'm not picking on one side or the other. I'm using that as a broad, broad statement. We have to be held accountable. And so if I'm constantly testing and proving, I mean, I look. I I look financially every month. What ministries do you give to that are out there. And then those same ministries, what do they do to show results? Because if they're supposed to be evangelical, but nobody's getting saved, then hold up. I don't think I'm going to give to this till you tell me what's happening. Now we have to, I mean... COVID throwed everybody a curveball, amen? And so it kind of shut a lot of things down. But can I say to you that through that, a ministry that is Christ-centered and will pass the scrutiny is going to take that curveball and figure out how to deal with it, okay? When I, just a few weeks ago, I, I met with a gentleman from the North Carolina uh, State Convention, and he said, since you couldn't come to us, we figured out a way to come to you and see, Pastor, what do you need? How can we help you? What's your greatest need right now? If God gave you a blank check, what would you want him to write on it? And he wasn't the first one. And so it's a good thing to know that on that level, they're willing to make adjustments to meet people where they are. But can I say, that's what we have to do? Instead of being up here on our pedestals saying you need to be this way and that way, why don't we come down and say, won't you walk with me and let me show you a better way? Sometimes you've got to make the adjustments. I'm, I'm not putting things down, but tent meetings don't have the same effect that they did in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. What does is meeting somebody out there in the world, as the Great Commission says, and as you're living, tell them about Jesus. Because I'll be honest with you, unless they see me and you living it out there, they ain't going to come in here. They ain't going to come listen to some pot-bellied preacher harp for 45 minutes if they don't see him living it out there, right? And so we have to live it. And so Paul is saying, listen, Prove everything and put everything to the test and then and then keep testing it and keep trying it to see if it's still effective. See if it's still working. <laughs> Monday evening, I had and if anybody wants anything to do for the next three days, I'm gonna be putting eight foot pressure treated posts in the ground and five inches around, eight foot long. I can use all the help we can get. I can sit them posts in the hole if you'll dig the hole. 
because I was digging with that that auger and and it said you can run it by one man. If you run it by yourself, it'll kill you eventually. But I was trying my best to dig this hole where it needed to go. And I was putting it in the ground, putting it in the ground, putting it in the ground. Can I say after about 45 minutes on that one hole, I finally decided this ain't working. <laughs> I got to do something different. Come to find out, I was on a, I, I was hitting on a piece of board about that wide, and when I, and I finally broke through it, and when I broke through it, I was, there was a piece of slate rock about that thick underneath it, and I just said, forget it. I'm going to wear myself out on one. I got a whole bunch more to do, and so I left it. Sometimes you and I have to keep testing and saying, it's because it worked last month, is it going to work this month? Because it worked in 1970 doesn't mean it's going to work now. Just because it worked in 2000 don't mean it's going to work now. And so you've got to be willing to keep testing it and proving it and making sure. Because let me tell you something. The standard will never change. It will always work. And that's Jesus. The scripture never changes. It will always work. So we can trust those two. And let's just make sure everything else scrutinize everything secure that which is good hold fast he said hold fast the word the phrase hold fast comes from two Greek words that literally means to hold or to force down and it literally gives this definition of to keep secure and to keep firm possession of. Uh, one, the, the Strong's Dictionary says it means to hold firmly, to hold fast, or to hold down. It means to hold as to avoid relinquishing it. And so in other words, I'm going to hold on for dear life. When I was in high school, we went whitewater rafting. And there was more of us than there were guides. And so for some reason, them people thought it was a good idea to put a bunch of high school boys and one guy that had never been on a boat in his life in their own whitewater raft, and they said, just stay close. I, 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 I never will forget. Just stay close. Uh-huh. Okay. And I never will forget, one of them boys' daddy told him, if you drop that paddle, I'm going to take that $75 out of your hide. Okay, daddy. And I never will. Somehow, some way, all six of them other boats was on that side of the river. And here we were on this side. Every guide on that side. Hollering, up, you got to get back over it. We're trying. I mean, it was like a Jerry Clower tale, okay? I, I mean, they're over there screaming, get on this side. We're over here trying our best. We're hooked up on rocks, can't get. And I never will forget, my buddy dropped his paddle. Man overboard. He jumped. I mean, you go through all that. Do not, do not get out of the boat. I'm, I cannot tell you how many times we were told to not. And he dropped that paddle, and the next thing I heard was kaploosh, and out he goes. And I said, what are you doing? He said, I got to get that paddle because I don't want $75 out of my hide. So he grabs hold of the paddle, and I grab hold of him. The guy who is our guide, who we brought from Spruce Pine, is standing there in the boat yelling at me, Nate, don't turn him loose. And I'm holding on just as tight as I can because this is my friend. This is my pal. I've run behind him in football. He's kept me from getting killed while I carry the ball. I want, and I'm holding on to They're yelling, you hold on to him. And I'm telling him, don't let go of that paddle. Holding on, not willing to relinquish it. To this day, I still don't know how I got, because he outweighed me by about 150, 160 pounds, and I don't know how I got him in that boat. Just adrenaline and everything, and I, I chunked him in the boat, and I never will forget, he was laying there, eyes closed, with that paddle in both hands, just like he was shaking. And I, 
Oh, pal, you can open your eyes. It's all good. We're all in the boat. Somehow we got in the right current and it got us over there with the rest of them. <laughs> I ain't never been whitewater rafting since. The idea that Paul is saying, listen, when you put it to the test, what you find out that is good, hold on to it to the point to where ain't nothing can take it out of your grasp. Hold on to it that to the, and to the point to where you are not going to relinquish it. You're going to hold with everything you've got. Hold fast to that which is good. The word good means virtuous and valuable. Can I say hold on to what glorifies God? I, I made a little list. For those of you that are willing to, 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 to follow me, and, and, and make your list as well as I, uh, that which is good, what will, what will, uh, what will, satis- what will magnify the sun, what will satisfy the spirit, what will glorify God, what will edify the saint, what will evangelize the sinner. All of those things will prove to be something good. What is taught and tested by scripture if you and I those things whatever will evangelize the sinner whatever will edify the saint can I, can I go back Paul tells us in the book of Galatians that all things are lawful to me but not all things edify what he is saying there is I may have a license to be able to do as I wish but if I do what I wish what's it going to do to edify the church What's it going to, is it going to cause a stumble? I, I, you and I are going to fall under one or two categories in people's lives. We're either going to be stepping stones or stumbling blocks. Which are we going to be? Are we going to be a stumbling block to where in their Christian walk they stumbling over our actions? Or are we going to be stepping stones that will get them to a higher plane with the Lord? And so what edifies the saint and if it edifies everybody not just one not just two now I'm talking there may be some preferences but I'm talking about convictions that are backed up by scripture chapter and verse that we can turn to because a conviction will work on every continent a preference will only work around people that have the same preferences amen I I mean last week while I was uh, over there preaching at Yellow Mountain there was only about three people that drove Chevrolets the rest of them drove Fords I told him, I said, I know why the Lord sent me to this place. (laughs) And every night I made some kind of comment, you know, something about it. (laughs) Half that church didn't even know Peter Pan peanut butter was good until I showed up. I'll tell you a funny story. They brought, they come in one night and uh, they said, they brought me a a jar of peanut butter. And I said, back in the old days, you used to pay the preacher with chickens. I said, this, these people over here painting with Peter Pan peanut butter. Glory, hallelujah. I'm close to heaven. They just thought that was hilarious. But I had, I don't know how many people, I bought my, my, first, I bought my first jar of Peter Pan peanut butter today. I didn't even know if it was any account. Changed your life, didn't it? I got talking about the first night how I wanted a pecan waffle. I don't really call them pecans. I call them pecans. But I wanted a pecan waffle from Waffle House. Took me three towns to find a Waffle House open so that I could get one. But there was some ladies coming. They said, you've inspired us. We've never had a pecan waffle from, from Waffle House. I said, get you a pecan waffle and get some peanut butter uh, sprinkles on top of it. And I promise you, get you a black cup of coffee and your life will be different from that day on. Amen? But you see, all of that's preference. All of that, the, the, the preacher's boy said, I went to Waffle House today. He said, I ain't much like that pecan waffle, but I did like him peanut butter chips. That's his preference. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about holding on to preferences. I'm talking on to things that have scriptural value and virtue to them that have been tested. I still believe it's through the foolishness of preaching that God draws sinners. I still believe that the blood is what is needed for the salvation of men's souls. I still believe, I still believe that singing plows the dirt for the seed to be planted in and if it's good scriptural stuff, it'll be a blessing to everybody. I still believe that. 
But now that's not, none of that, none of that, none of that is my preference. Now you can go to bluegrass, contemporary or southern gospel, red hymn book, white hymn book, blue hymn book, chuck wagon book, whatever you want to. I've got several over there. And you know what's funny to me is a lot of them hymn books got the same songs in them just with a different cover. And people think because they got the cover they're familiar with that the song's better in that one. Amen. I mean, I got cracked up today thinking about that because most of the songs that we sing are all in the same book. That's preference. But where the Bible teaches you and I to encourage one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, we need to make sure that the songs we're singing fit that verse of Scripture. That's not preference. That's conviction. Scrutinize everything, secure, secure, and keep holding on to everything that is good, that's tested and taught by the Word of God. Everything that is within the Word of God that will evangelize, edify, glorify, magnify, and satisfy. And if it'll fit through those... Hold on to it for dear life. Like a $75 boat paddle. (laughs) And I tell you that that daddy was in that lifeboat watching his son hold on to a paddle and be held by another guy. And that daddy was yelling at me, don't you let my boy go. And when they got over there, when it was over with, that boy showed, he said, Daddy, I didn't lose. And that, that daddy throwed that paddle down and hugged his boy and said, I'd gladly give $75 to know you're all right. And they said, why are you telling us that side of the story? Because I'm right now done. You and I would throw away a whole lot of stuff just to know that our young, our young ones, that our church, that those that are around us are going to be okay. So let's hold on to what is true. Let's hold on to what can be trusted. Scrutinize everything. Secure what is good. Prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. What are you holding on to right now? If you're holding on to governmental systems, they change in politicians, they're wishy-washy. Denominations are unsettled. Preachers can be bought. Churches can be swayed, but Jesus Christ and his word is forevermore settled. Let us hold fast to that which is good. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for your leadership in tonight, and I pray, God, that everything that was said would be edifying to your body, glorifying to you, and magnifying your Son. I pray, God, individually, collectively, Lord, we'd prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. Thank you for what you've done in our midst. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. I love you. See you Sunday morning, Father's Day, Lord willing. Lord willing, we'll be preaching Romans chapter 8. I am adopted. And we're looking forward to that. So if you will, be praying for that service, praying for the special singing, and looking forward to what God's got in store for us. I love you. God bless you. And we'll see you.